thank you for inviting me to speak on the Neurocritical Care Author Insights uh, webinar today. Uh, my name is Michael Rubin. I'm a neurointensivist from UT Southwestern, as well as a clinical ethicist. Um, and I'm going to be speaking about uh, an American Academy of Neurology position statement that came out online not too long ago. Um, uh, and essentially, this is uh, the official title is the AAN position statement for COVID-19 pandemic and the ethical duties of the neurologist. Um, uh, this was a very much a collaborative work of the Ethics, Law and Humanities Committee, which is a joint uh, committee of the American Academy of Neurology, the American Neurology Association, the Child Neurology Society, and in this particular position statement, we partnered with the ethics group from the Neurocritical Care Society. As many of these issues uh, come to play um, in the neurocritical care environment, we thought it would be uh, valuable to have uh, the input of that group as well. Um, and at the time of, of its creation, we were very much pressured to put it together, um, have the various committees, the board review it, and um, produce something useful in a very limited amount of time. Um, and if you ever have been involved with position statement work, um, that's, that's quite a, a, a monumental task. Um, you have to make sure everyone who's a stakeholder has a chance to offer their opinion, give their insights, and to uh, build something. Um, but we thought it was essential to provide some guidance, um, both to the programs that already are constructing um, uh, the methods in which they're adapting to the pandemic, as well as uh, provide a starting point for those that uh, don't know where to begin. Um, so it's, it's important that your society supports you, and that's why we, created this uh, document. Um, it turns out that the pandemic uh, um, has surged again. So this, uh, this position statement probably uh, not only continues to be relevant, but for many people may be more relevant. Um, and I, I hope it provides some assistance. Um, in addition to this webinar, um, I'm encouraging people to, to review the document. Um, it is an ethics piece, and so at the core of it is um, uh, some guidance on how to balance your duties. So uh, uh, every practitioner is very familiar with um, the primary Hippocratic fiduciary obligation we have to our patients. So uh, your duty to accept your patient's um, health needs as your own priority um, to uh, put it above your own um, um, concerns and priorities in the professional sphere, and uh, to be willing um, uh, to take their worries and concerns and needs as your own. Um, in time, that obligation has uh, uh, learned to be balanced with the physician's obligation to society as a whole. Um, and before the pandemic, we, we work in the status of your fiduciary obligation really driving what you're doing um, with some consideration for public health. Uh, so for example, reporting communicable disease, um, uh, being a good steward of limited resources, not getting MRIs for every headache, for example. Um, but with the pandemic, the need for public health has uh, uh, increased in prioritization. And if this is where your fiduciary obligation was and this is public health, they're now brought up to the same par. And, and hopefully we see this as increasing public health and not having a decrease in your fiduciary obligation. Um, but anytime that we're considering um, whether you should do something or not, we now have to consider both is this good for my patient or my patients, as well as uh, how will this impact the greater uh, community welfare? Um, so uh, many people will say, well, why do I have an obligation to society? I'm a physician, I should be taking care of my patients. But uh, that relationship certainly has changed if you look at the amount of investment that society makes in us. 
So our, our education, our training is supplemented um, uh, by public funding. In many ways, um, we have a set of esoteric knowledge that um, only physicians and our APPs and our nurse partners um, are trained in order to perform. Um, and so if people can't come to us for these things, they have nowhere to go. So we very much have an obligation to um, consider the public welfare. Um, so moving on to specific areas that have changed with the pandemic, the first that probably has the largest reach is the growth of telehealth. We already knew that telehealth was very, uh, uh, very workable, very effective. We already had um, the, the building of codes for people that do telehealth interactions. And uh, luckily the infrastructure had already been developed for many of those encounters. Um, the ethical question comes up, um, who decides? Who decides that an encounter should be telehealth? Who decides that it should be in person? Um, of course, this calculus is gonna change on where you are and the laws that are being enforced at the time, the risk level at the time, the prevalence of COVID in the community. Um, but in its heart, we think that this should be a shared decision. Um, the physician and the patient um, um, uh, should be deciding together if, uh, if there is a need for an inpatient visit um, if it's someone's preference. I think we know more and more about the virus that we can um, usually provide enough um, safety measures in our own masking and face covering and um, uh, increasing in space between people that uh, we can do an inpatient, uh, an in-person visit. Um, likewise, if someone is inpatient, um, uh, depending on where they are, that can be an in-person uh, visit or video conferencing is set up that can be done um, uh, remotely. But we have to decide at what point do you simply have to be in the room um, or when is it the patient's uh, desire is such that they want to be with you. Um, with that comes the caveat that uh, people have to accept there's going to be differences in timing. Um, I think many people might prefer telehealth at this point. Many people might think, wow, it's efficient. I can go down and grab my coffee and, and throw on the computer and talk to my doc and I don't have to wait in, in the waiting room or drive there. It's just boom, I'm there. Um, and really I need to have a conversation with them and not a thorough exam. So that's maybe what they want. While um, other patients may not be as uh, technologically savvy and um, uh, feel an aversion and want that um, in-room communication and, and experience. Um, the next uh, issue we wanted to discuss is um, goals of care. So uh, certainly anyone with a chronic illness should be having conversations with their uh, clinicians about um, uh, what they would want in various circumstances, especially if their ability to communicate their wishes would be impaired. Um, and that should extend to COVID-19 as well. Um, if you have a chronic illness and you're immune suppressed and you're potentially more susceptible to um, acquiring COVID-19 or um, um, having a more severe course, um, that should be part of your calculation. Um, fortunately, now we're starting to acquire more information about the true risk to people with chronic conditions that are on, on immune suppression. So your provider should be aware of those risks and discuss them with you when they um, help you formulate your goals of care. And it may be about not only do you want to be intubated, you want to be resuscitated, but also um, uh, what circumstance do you want to go to an inpatient setting? Um, and when are you willing to be cared for um, remotely? Um, and another big issue uh, that providers have, have come across, and it's much more in areas that are considered hotspots, um, is uh, practicing medicine outside of your scope of practice, or perhaps it's better to say within your scope of practice, but not within your area of true specialty. So for example, this would be a hospital that um, is overwhelmed with COVID-19 and the pulmonologist and the medical group are um, overwhelmed on taking care of those patients. Um, 
And so there's more stable medical patients in the hospital that need a clinician to help manage them. So uh, many places I've considered, uh, could a neurologist do such a role? Uh, we have uh, a background in internal medicine, at least a solid year internship. However, it's been a long time since many people have managed um, cholesterol, hypertension, renal disease, heart failure. Um, uh, certainly, it's likely that neurocritical care providers could assist with this role in as much as we manage these things um, on a regular basis. But uh, as far as your outpatient-focused neurologist, they may not be as familiar. Um, however, if they are the, uh, the most capable, if they are credentialed by the hospital, if they feel um, somewhat familiar, it may be appropriate for them to take care of these patients um, if, if they are the best option. Now, we strongly recommend in this position payment, uh, paper that if you're going to take such action, if a hospital is going to ask of us to work a little outside of our comfort zone, that they take on the burden of making sure that the, uh, the patients are um, uh, as stable as possible for that disease set, and that they're making sure that you're appropriately covered by state and liability protection. Um, in as much as the hospital is making a decision, not just for you as a clinician, but for the whole institution. So the key is they shouldn't ask us to do things for which we are not at least um, somewhat qualified and capable, and they need to manage the workload so we um, can take care of patients um, uh, up to the standard of care for that specialty. Um, as far as the role of tertiary care centers, they will often become uh, a place where, where many patients with COVID um, will be brought uh, because they do have expertise and they serve their community in the greater sense. Um, uh, so some might wonder, well, um, what about the role as a, a neurology focused tertiary care center or a neurocritical care unit? Um, uh, do we have the same obligation to society or the community that we're serving? And in short, I would say yes. Uh, each hospital has to um, make sure that they're safe and they can keep their doors open and manage the patients that are presenting immediately to them. Um, however, we, we can't um, have created healthcare networks that community hospitals are dependent on and then all of a sudden not offer um, transfers for um, endovascular retrieval for strokes, for example. Um, if they haven't built those systems already, um, to take them away would really um, be harming patients besides those that are affected by COVID-19. Now, it may be that they have to have additional steps of screening to make sure that they're identified whether they have COVID-19 themselves. Um, if a hospital is not offering a particular intervention to their own patients that presents because of uh, resource uh, um, scarcity, then it's reasonable to not also offer those to tertiary uh, referral requesters. Um, but if it is something that they can provide both to their local community, uh, it would be ethically advised to continue offering that to the community in itself. Um, on the topic, and this is the final thing that we'll talk about, uh, of scarce resource allocation. So this is the um, worst case scenario when uh, hospital resources have gone from usual practice to their contingency plans to a critical state when there are limitations and available of ventilators or dialysis machines or ICU beds or um, clinicians or nursing staff. Um, as much as we thought it was going to be all about ventilators, it seems that uh, experience is showing us that uh, there are many other resources, um, PPE certainly, um, that we may only have so much of. So um, what is the academy position in this position statement um, regarding scarce resources? And 
uh, there are many different protocols out there. First, we would say it's good to have a protocol. There should be some plan. Not having a plan is in itself just leaving things to first come, first serve, which uh, will not um, allocate resources to those that are more likely to benefit. Um, it will also lead to a tremendous amount of moral distress to the clinicians on the front end who have to make decisions in a rapid way without institutional guidance. So we think institutions should really um, help people um, provide an external committee to offer them advice and guidelines on how to allocate resources to regularly review how uh, operations are being implemented in regard to scarce resources. Um, the part that is most specific to neurologists is uh, first to recognize that patients with neurologic disease uh, very much have their own um, complexities as far as likelihood of recovery, likelihood of a intervention providing a clear benefit, um, and that uh, neurologists should be very much involved in this process. So if, if they're gonna consider um, uh, allocating a resource to or from neurology patients, a neurologist should be involved in that policy development. Um, the other big point with scarce resource allocation is what about um, those with severe neurologic disease that's going to hamper their ability to experience the world, have consciousness, um, their quality of life? Um, uh, um, should those things be considered when we allocate scarce resources? Now, the uh, we, we uh, have noted that we certainly understand why these things might be considered in an allocation protocol. Um, however, uh, we emphasize that uh, there's so much we just don't know about a patient with an acute neurologic insult, what their life is going to be like later on. Um, uh, will they recover in six months or a year? Um, what is that life going to mean for that person um, or their family? Um, and because our ability to predict those changes is, is um, so imperfect that we would discourage using um, um, quality of life measures in regard to neurologic injury and scarce resource allocation. Um, fortunately, this has not had to be executed in, in any uh, large sense, um, but we don't know where things may go. And so as terrifying it is to think about these things, um, it's better to have a plan than um, uh, figure it out when, when the pressure is on and decisions are imminent. So uh, the final thing that I wanna leave our viewers and readers of the paper with is this is very much a, a discussion. Um, uh, the way we've done scarce allocation has changed in time with feedback from um, the disability community, for example. And I think it should keep on changing. We should go on our um, society web pages that have secure message boards and discuss these issues, share your experience, and um, contribute to the literature, write a review, write an opinion, um, say how you things are and how they, they ought to be. Um, and with that, hopefully we'll continue to adapt, evolve, and make sure that uh, we do our best to serve not only our patients, but also the greater community. So thank you all very much for listening today. I hope everyone um, uh, finds peace, finds balance, and stays healthy. Thanks.